Good evening from Salisbury Presbyterian Church in Midlothian, Virginia. You're joining us for Fridays After Five presented by Chase, and I am particularly excited to be in this building with the people in the room with me tonight. It was, it's coming up on 30 years somewhere ago when my mother collected my two sisters and I, and we walked some distance in the grass on the side of the road in Midlothian through a parking lot to a church I'd noticed but never visited. She dropped us off, and inside we met other children, we met a nice lady, and we saw some tables. That day I touched my first handbell. I looked at a piece of music with the intent to learn for the first time at Mount Pisgah United Methodist Church. A couple of weeks later, excuse me, the nice lady I'd met in that sanctuary was gone, and I was met with a new nice lady who I had never seen. Some weeks later, I decided that this new nice lady teaching me to read music and to play music must be Maria von Trapp herself <laughs> from The Sound of Music. And I still a little bit believe that, even though I'm 37 years old. If Maria von Trapp is here in Virginia, she also calls herself Kathy Armistead. <laughs> Kathy, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show. You know how dear you are to me, and uh, I know very many things about you, but the folks on the other side of the camera may not. Before we get into our conversation, would you tell them a little bit about who you are in your own words? Sure, thank you for having me. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to do this with my good friend, um, Robert. And he's like my second son. And um, it, yeah, it's coming up on 30 years that we met and I got to meet his two sisters and his mom and they all sang with me at Mount Pisgah and rang bells and it was just, it was phenomenal. And then we met several years later mm. at Reveille. Several years later, I'll, I'll quickly, I, I came back to Richmond intending to be here for just a short time. I was on my way to California to become a movie star. And I stopped off at Mount Pisgah looking for Kathy and they told me, no, you've got to find her at Reveille. And I found you there and I didn't leave. That encounter made me stay. <laughs> <laughs> and now here we are at Salisbury. That, yeah, that was fantastic. Um, that, that particular day when I saw you on the sidewalk, uh, I was praying for a tenor, actually, to <laughs> join our chancel choir, and there you were. And it's, it's been just a wonderful ride ever since. Absolutely, and we're going to definitely invite you back for more of these programs because we've got more stories to tell. But since then, we performed together uh, many different concerts for many different reasons, uh, for many different occasions, including installations of bishops or just <laughs> Christmas holiday season or concerts. You got me composing and conducting and soloing. Um, and I thank you for that. I wouldn't be the musician I am uh, without Kathy Armistead, without you. Uh, but before all of that, where does your interest in music come from? Oh gosh. Um, well, they tell me when I was two years old, I started singing and my grandmother had a piano in her house. And I spent a lot of time with my grandmother up in northern Indiana. Mm. I was born in South Bend. And um, so I spent a lot of time there. And mu that must have rubbed off on me. And I've always been very curious about keyboard instruments. So when we moved to Richmond, our next door neighbors had this old pump organ. Mm. And I was about eight years old. And I went over there just to you know, look at it and try it out and see what it was all about. And I think I probably made a nuisance out of myself because <laughs> I think I went back several times to play that pump organ. And there was a, a wonderful pipe organ in our church where we were going at the time. And um, I, I got the bug. I only ever wanted to play the organ. <laughs> My parents tried to talk me into the clarinet. It was cheaper, but um, no, I wanted the organ. So I started taking organ lessons actually when I was 10 years old. Mm. And um, the place that I started taking lessons, we did lots of performances, all from memory. Mm. And um, I took lessons there through high school. And then when I got to college, I didn't really know if I wanted to major in music, but they convinced me to. And um, it's 
been, you know, I've been playing the organ ever since. Well, you got bit and you got bit good. I, I've heard <laughs> you play. I remember being a child and my mother commenting about your organ playing. Um, and Miss Armistead, that's what I called you then, about <laughs> Miss Armistead and how great an organist she was and how much she enjoyed to sing with you then. Uh, you spent some time studying organ, became a cheerleader for a while. <laughs> I think your <laughs> megaphone is still at Reveille if you want to go pick that up. It probably is. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's still sitting in the hallway behind the chancel area uh, there. Now, you study in college. How soon after college or was it while you're in college did you begin your career as a church musician? So, uh, when I was 14 years old, there was a little church that was out near where we lived in Henriker County, and they needed an organ, and they needed an organist. Mm -hmm. And so they bought their organ at the place where I was taking lessons, which was Hammond Organ Studios at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of came as a package deal. Oh. <laughs> and so I've, I've been playing in church since I was 14. Um, played all the way through high school and then did some subbing when I was in college and then um, got a church job as soon as I, I came home after my bachelor's degree and it was when I was in a Baptist church a couple of years later that I, I really saw the possibility for a large music ministry with multiple children's choirs, youth choir, handbells, you know, the whole nine yards. And um, I, I really feel that God was calling me to do that. And so I went to grad school and majored in organ. I was majoring in church music as well, but I finished my organ degree first and um, then got a sort of a full-time job in a church in Ashland, Virginia, mm. and um, have been doing that ever since. We are in the land of the frozen chosen now. Uh, before you get to, <laughs> to the Presbyterian Church, um, Methodism is what brings me to you, yes. Mount Pisgah there. You spend a lot of time with children, myself included, and that has to have been a rewarding experience. Would you talk a little bit about how you developed the passion and held for so long the passion for developing young musicians? Um, I, I think I sort of got that bug too. When I was working in my bachelor's degree, I got that in music education mm. and um, had really good choir directors when I was a child and a youth in elementary school and in junior high school. <clears throat> and um, I, I really feel their influence on me in that. Mm. And um, just, I, I really have always enjoyed working with children and with youth choirs and love seeing the development of children and youth and just see that sparkle in their eyes when they, you know, they do something really wonderful that they're very proud of and um, have, have always enjoyed that. You, um, I've told you this story before, you made me cry as a small boy. Um, not intentionally. <laughs> you weren't mean, you weren't evil, you weren't rough, you were none of those things. You were gentle and kind and loving. And you cast me in my first show as the lead. And I was a small boy. And I, I thought, Maria Von Trapp thinks I'm an actor for, for some reason. <laughs> I thought I'd lied to you. I thought I was a terrible child who had lied to this very nice lady, and now she's put me in a show and I have to act, and I'm going to let her down. I worked very hard becoming an actor. <laughs> for you, uh, that inspiration you have on children is remarkable. I mean, I, I'm touched by it. I still am. I, I talked about you in high school. No one knew who you were, but Kathy didn't say do it like that, so I wasn't going to. <laughs> Thank you for the influence you've had on me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, we, we had some, some fun together at Reveille doing large-scale productions. I'm speaking, of course, in particular of Superstar. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, how, I remember that very fondly. What sort of takeaways do you have from that experience? Oh, my gosh. Um, that's, that is still one of the, the highlights of my career. Mm -hmm. I was able to do Jesus Christ Superstar twice. And um, I did it first with Midlothian High School when I was at Mount Pisgah, and then I got Catherine Bogger, who was the drama teacher yes. at Midlothian High School at the time, and I got her to come over to Reveille, and she helped me do it there, and I, I will never, ever forget that experience, to be able to combine 
the musical genius of Andrew Lloyd Webber with the story of the passion of, the, of Christ mm -hmm. and to be able to share that with so many participants, so many children and youth and adults. Um, I just, I, it's just glorious. We, we ran that show five times, I think it was. Yes. <laughs> Sold out, packed that 900 seat sanctuary each one. And before each show, I remember those kids were off building homes around town yes. and then coming to perform for their community. What a remarkable ministry you put together. Yes, that, yes, that was in, in July of mm -hmm. 2013 and it was really hot. <clears throat> and so we were out building homes during the day and working in gardens and things like that. And then we would come at night and do Superstar. And, um, and it was just fabulous. And I have to tell a story on you really quick mm -hmm. because we lost, oh. we lost our Judas character and I think that was maybe 40 days before we were going to do a performance. <laughs> and I needed another Judas. And so I was just desperately trying to think, who could do Judas? Who could do Judas? Of course, Robert can do <laughs> Judas. And so, and you had a full-time job at the time. And you, know, and you just, you are able to absorb music and just be able to perform it so flawlessly in short periods of time. That is really a gift. Well, thank you. To be able to do that. And it was, it was just glorious. Well, you were thank wonderful. you. I'll take that compliment and I will wear it well <laughs> and I'll share it with you. I, I do it well because you taught me how. <laughs> Kathy, I want to talk to you for a year more with these cameras in the room with us, but I promised the folks at home some organ music. Would you play a little something? Sure. All right, I'm looking forward to it. And then later on, we are going to be welcomed um, by Kathy Toole at Bonaire United Methodist for an organ piano duet, and then a bit of piano recital from Kathy Toole over there. Before we hang up these cameras, we can't talk about Superstar without at least mentioning the work Ingrid put into teaching those kids the choreography there. She was featured on my dance program a little while ago. Um, can't forget Ingrid as we speak. But Kathy, that's all I've got. Uh, if you're ready for it, your Oregon bench is calling. Thank you, absolutely. Right, thank you. It's a pleasure.
those of you at home, welcome now to Bon Air, United Methodist Church. And in the room with me, sitting on the pew across, is Kathy Toole, the second keyboardist in our series. And before Kathy Armistead joins you in the chancel area for a fabulous duet, I've heard you rehearse. Um, we had a great time at Salisbury, mm -hmm. Kathy at her organ bench. And I'm looking forward to hearing you at the piano here at Bon Air. You're both very prolific church musicians in my mind. To you, Kathy, what is the significant role of the musician in the church? The music in the church helps people transcend mm -hmm. um, even rational thinking. It helps, you know, go deeply within the soul. The words that we sing over and over again penetrate over time. And I don't know about you, but so many times when I am in a worship service, um, especially the music and the liturgy, help me to reorient. Mm. And especially when we are together as a community, joining our voices, our hearts, our minds, our prayers, it's bigger than we are. Mm. And so ideally, we connect with God together. I love that. I mean, we do that also at home in, or other places by ourselves, individually, but corporately, there's a strength in singing together and worship together. You know, so many people learn the stories of the Bible, uh, scripture, the lessons through the songs. They're, they're grounded, like you said earlier today, um, recording Kathy's organ recital. I, I told her at the end for the first time in a long time, I felt a sense of reverence. Mm. And for me, being in a, a space like this, full of music, I, I don't know, I, I missed that feeling, Kathy, and I, I have felt that again here, hearing you play. Uh, on the program tonight, we feature a piece that's become very special to you, I can tell, and having discussed it, Florence Price writes uh, gorgeous piano music. Who is she? Why is she significant? And why did you bring her to the program today? Well, I will say that Florence Price also has written concertos mm. and um, organ music and solo music. Mm. She's an all-around musician. And... Um, the world has not remembered her until recently. Hmm. She was um, born in, 19, in 1887. Mercy. And died in 1953. She won, she was the first black woman to win the um, Wanamaker Prize, hmm. which um, was for a concerto that she wrote and the Chicago Symphony played it. And um, that was part of the prize. And so, but, so she got that recognition, but then when she um, tried to get, it didn't, trans it didn't translate later. So she would contact different orchestras mm -hmm. and encourage them to play her music. Mm -hmm. And they said she wouldn't fit their audience. Mm. So um, there were, there was, um, Chicago was well suited for her. She was born in Little Rock, Arkansas. <laughs> you can imagine what that was like. Yes. Um, and, and moved to Chicago because of the, um, the attitudes of people. But so Chicago gave her some opportunity to perform um, and do some teaching and so forth. But when she died in 53, it was like she disappeared. Mm -hmm. And she was not remembered. Her, her children didn't really carry on her legacy. And there was um, a, a couple, I listened to, Michelle Can, who has um, done some of, performed some of her work, and 
Michelle Can was saying that this couple bought a, an old house mm -hmm. for a summer vacation home. And they found these boxes of music mm. in the attic. Just coincidence. Yeah. Mm. You know, I think the universe is pretty special. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were the right people to move in there because it found its way to the, um, let me see, Center for Black Music Research in mm. Chicago. Mm. And so, but then they didn't know, you know, who owned the copyrights. Shermer had published some, the prize, the, okay. the concerto and this sonata that I'm playing today. Um, but they didn't know how to get to any relatives. Um, there was a New York Times article that one of her grandchildren read mm -hmm. and contacted them. And so with that grandchild, and this was, I believe, in 2018. Wow. So this is very, very recent. Practically yesterday. Right. That um, then they found more of her music between them that they had kept over the years. But one example Michelle Can was talking about her in the, the attic music was it was a, the concerto for uh, two pianos because you know when you didn't have an orchestra mm -hmm. two people played it on the piano but in the markings was you know oboe and, and so forth. And so they tried to reconstruct the concerto with from her notes on that. But with the grandson they ended up finding the orchestral score. And so this interview that I, I heard from Michelle was actually last summer, 2019, okay. and she had just gotten the completed score from Shermer the day before. That's incredible. That, that, yeah. I wonder how similar their guessing at recreating the work was to the, her score. Well, she hadn't even had a chance to find out. She, <laughs> <laughs> she, she had... Um, she saw where there were some chords that she had never played uh -huh. on the piano. Uh -huh. But, um, so she's gonna have to relearn that thing. <laughs> what a fabulous story. Just stumble across the music in an attic. Right. And it's something like, I wonder, it reminds me of, of finishing the Mozart Requiem and people trying to piece together Mozart's notes right. to get that thing done. Posthumous. You know. Right, yeah. not similar music at all, but a similar way of coming about it. I want to know more about Florence Price, and I, I haven't asked you before, but I'd, I'd love you to come back and do some more of her music for us <laughs> in a later episode, if you're willing, um, Kathy. You're playing tonight also some Debussy. Mm. Tell me about it. Oh, uh, well, Debussy is, was one of the very first um, classical um, orchestral composers that I fell in love with. It was La Mer. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so loved, have always loved his music. And so I played the two things from the Suite Bergamesque, which has four movements. Um, Bergamesque, uh, Bergamo was a city in Italy in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, and one thing I read suggested that the Bergamesque might be a dance, oh. um, a rustic dance that was done. But you've got the four movements, and, and it may be that also that the people from Bergamo were called Bergamesques. I don't know. But so I played the prelude and the very lovely and well-loved um, Claire de Lune. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I so. mean, tears. Mm -hmm. tears. Uh, you're figuring it out at home. She's already played it and we're doing the interview after, but man, I've never heard someone take fingers to keys to play Claire de Lune in the way you did tonight. Oh, well, beautiful music, thank only you. when beautiful fingers approach it. So thank, thank you. you for that. Uh, well, Kathy, I have bored our audience enough with my <laughs> voice and I think they're ready to hear you and Kathy get onto right. your instruments. And then after Kathy Armistead leaves her organ bench, we get just a few moments alone with you at the piano. Thank you so much for being here. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been fun.